We're Fraser and Penny Barry, we're from Bindi, a property in East Gippsland, Victoria. Bindi has been in the family for over a hundred years. We run sheep and cattle, uh, have done for a long while. The dogs have uh, given us a, a bit of a caning. That was a, a situation stage when we thought we might have to get out because of the, the numbers that we're losing. It just kept on getting worse and worse and worse and then after the 2003 fires it sort of just escalated to a, a, a degree where we were losing probably 1,500 sheep a year. Many, many sleepless nights. I mean it was just that we knew we had to change or we were going out the back door fast and we just had to change our thought processes how we were going to uh, handle it. We've got a, a family farming operation here at Bindi. Yeah, been in Gippsland region for a fair while and we've had a fair bit to do with the, the wild dog issue, trying to run sheep in a mountain sub, subalpine region. So it's, yeah, it's been a bit of an issue for us. Well the wild dogs have been, and previously called a, a dingo I guess, have been in the region uh, since eternity, or before white man well and truly, for 30,000 years. So they've evolved into the landscape. But we've in recent times seen the landscape, generally speaking, out in the crown change. Um, it's become a, a more dense forest, I suppose. It's suiting some species more than others. And I think the wild dog, the dingo, the deer, a few of those species have actually flourished in that changed alpine landscape. We as producers are suffering the consequences of that. There's, uh, who knows, there's thousands more wild dogs out there now than there ever was before. We're feeling that now because they're coming in to kill our livestock. Anything that's impacting on private property, we, we classify it as a wild dog. So whether it's a a hybrid cross between domestic dogs and the dingo um, or what some may call the purebred dingo further out. It's irrelevant when it's within the farming area uh, because it needs to be dealt with. They're hybridised dogs now. Mm -hmm. They're not the purebred dog anymore. The purebred dog had a different attitude, a different mindset. He killed because he needed to kill. He needed to feed himself and feed his litter. These hybridised dogs, they kill for the sport. They enjoy it. Yeah. They'll maul the sheep won't even eat it, go and maul another one. Five sheep later, they might decide to sit down and eat some of it. And that's not the habit of a purebred dog. And we've, we're faced now with the potential loss of our purebred alpine dingoes purely through that hybridisation process. We didn't sleep because while I was at, out trying to find mm. where the dogs were coming in, or we'll shoot a dog in the mornings and at night. So it was a, a constant program. And all you'd ever did was manage was dogs was think about mm. dogs and think about, oh, I've just got to stop these dogs because that's the problem. And it meant that we did not look at any other facet of our business. And it's very hard to, to get young people to come back into the farming yeah. situation again because they see how depressed mm. and how anxious how families, everyone is, how emotionally and, yeah. distraught they are over this issue. Mm. And you know, they don't want to borrow that. No. Yeah. It's yeah. another yeah. deterrent for them to come back into agriculture. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You feel so helpless because you can't do anything about it. You're in the wrong spot when the dog comes in and you just think, hey, how, do, how, do, how am I physically going to do any more? I'm doing as much as I can and it, all of a sudden you just feel, I can't, I can't cope. Mm. Yeah, the wives are picking yeah. all this up. The children feed on it. Mm. And it's, so the whole problem is a community problem and it does need to be shared. From a state government point of view, we've, we have the responsibility of managing wild dogs on public land um, and the wild dog program does that, but we're very strong on building community engagement as well. So that not, it's not only what's happening outside the private property boundary, it's also what's happening inside. So um, really strong to promote the idea of community um, ownership of wild dogs and what we call a nil tenure process, so look at the wild dogs across the whole landscape rather than just focusing on what, what the government's doing up in the hills and what's happening on Fraser's place here or over Simon's just over the hill over here. And to do that, uh, it's, it's, it's really the only way to minimise the impact of wild dogs on, on these guys. Um, we had the 03 fires, 2003 fires come through, which just basically nucleared everything, particularly on our crown interface in the bush. So we were forced to start all over again. Um, so we went for the latest technologies, I suppose, the latest designs. So we started using concrete and steel and porcelain. Um, we excised land back to the Crown that wasn't useful, that we couldn't put a fence on successfully. Mm -hmm. Put the fence in a, a very easy to manage and maintain location. And that's become our main backline now. That's the backbone of our whole um, survival. 
and with that we sort of trap or poison or shoot where necessary to deal with any issues that arise. The last three years we haven't had a dog in that we're aware of, so we, we think our program's working. If we didn't have that ongoing um, broader program outside in the Crown land, that pressure on our fence from a larger population outside, I think our fence would probably falter. By us putting that fence up there, it's created that solid barrier and they've had to find alternate food sources and move elsewhere. And once you start to take ownership of that problem, you can actually then start to find out ways to handle it. And you can, you can look for help and look for case studies that have happened before or what other people are doing and, and see what you can apply to your situation. We've done a lot of internal electric fencing. We've given up on the bush boundary fencings at the moment, more concentrating on cell fencing to keep the sheep behind electric fencing. We don't replace complete new fences. We do it a pretty simple, cost-effective way of running just two wires at the bottom. Seems to be enough. We also bait heavily ourselves. There's been a reasonably big change in, in the process of attacking wild dogs in the last few years. And I think people are really learning that together we can all achieve more. We've all attacked it on an individual basis for a long while and, and come up wanting in a lot of cases. We've been isolated and we've had traditional views of how to handle it. And we, we through the, the, the community engagement process that's been developed by Best Wool, and say AWI and caring for country grants and things like that that have come into the area in the last five, six years, I'd say, that we're actually learning other strategies that have worked elsewhere. And that's been a great learning curve. But the thing about that is that not everybody's come on board. And so the communication that Barry and, and Simon are talking about is really important within these groups to get the groups together so that we can all learn together. And they need to, you need to be patient. It's not a quick fix situation. Mm -hmm. It just takes time. You, you just gotta be free with your information and be sympathetic to others. And it takes time to develop that trust don't expect immediate results, but yeah. just keep slowly working through the issue and it does pay off in the long run. Yes. And, the, and the community groups are a really important um, aspect of the whole program as well because if Fraser's doing his own thing here and Simon's doing his own thing over there and they're not talking to each other, they're, they're, they're bottling up their issues as well. You heard the emotional stuff before and that's a very, very true. But when you, when you start forming a community and you get groups together and you start talking, it's a shared problem. So you then tackle it as a shared problem as well. And fencing is, is, is excellent. I mean, it's the Rolls Royce of wild dog control, but it's also, it also can be quite expensive. So there are many other options that people need to consider as well. So, so be it baiting, uh, trapping on their own properties, uh, using guardian animals. There's a, a, a plethora of things out there that can be done, but as a, as a community, um, if everybody's involved, it's a shared issue, and you're not just doing something by yourself. If you've got one person trying to control on his own patch and no one's doing anything around him, he just becomes a sink. So he cleans out his own problem, be it foxes, dogs, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. cleans them out, but there's always new ones coming in. So as a community, everybody doing a bit reduces that, that impact. You only have to take the first step and say, well, hang on, there are other, other communities that are having success, that means I must be able to have success mm. if I sort of look and see what they're doing and then take from them what will adapt to my place. On the outside of the, the, the private property on the public lands, the state government's responsible for that and, and putting resources into that. Back on private property, obviously the individuals can be, can be doing what they, what they so desire. But there is, there is also other, other funding options out there. Um, AWI currently are funding 18 groups throughout Victoria, so private groups, farm, farming communities, for using that and they can use that money to buy baits to bait on their own properties, they can use, they can use the money to hire a contractor if need be on their own private property, to buy trap kits um, and it's a great resource other than just the money but it's, it's bringing that community together again and it's a, it's a coordinated approach as to how they're going to spend that money. The money's there, if, if, you, are, if you are having problems with dogs at the moment, strongly encourage you to talk to your local, um, local government rep and your other community group members, who's the champion in the area, go and have a chat to them and see what you can actually put together and get a group structure happening. Uh, from a Victorian point of view, we are more than keen to work with those groups. So yeah, I can only, I can only encourage it.
our predation problem has really fallen away to nearly zero. We had a dog in this year. Last year we lost no sh uh, sheep to dogs. This year we, we had a dog inside the electric fence and we lost 40 until we got rid of that dog. And now, so we actually sleep at night now. The wild dog issue is a bit like alcoholism. You've got to actually realise you've got a problem before you can actually start to cure it. Uh, we, we've got the Spot rural on. counselling service um, mm. that has been a great benefit to the community. Um, if not directly, it's been indirectly. Someone else will talk to someone else down the pub on a Friday night or at the football on the Saturday and that stuff filters around. So it might not direct consultation, but it's also indirect. That has been another underplayed key factor in our, our, our future and our success.